Hi guys, Mr. Pulley here. Western Civilization, History of, right? Okay, chapters one through three, I did that as my introductory unit, calling it the Rise of Civilizations. Um, trying to adapt some old stuff from an old version of the text to a new version of the text. We'll see how it goes. Hope you guys can follow along. Before we get started, get out your study guide. Oh, you've already got it? Okay, sorry, never mind. Okay, you've got your study guide. As we go through here, feel free to stop me, pause me, mute me if you want to, but you're going to find you can get a lot of your answers from your study guide accomplished, finished, filled out right here, right now. So let's give it a shot. Here we go. Okay, let's look at some of the first terms here. Prehistory. That's the history that happens before writing happens. Well, how do you have history without writing? If you can't write it down, you can't have that big, boring book we talked about earlier. Okay, how do we do that? Pass the story on from generation to generation by telling it like a long-term game of telephone. Okay, or we just go back and look at stuff and try and figure out what was happening in history. Remember our puzzle we saw earlier? That's what I'm talking about, prehistory, okay? An anthropologist is someone who studies humanity and culture, tries to figure out by looking at that stuff what people did, how they lived, what they believed, what they thought, okay? Now, a paleontologist, this is what my youngest wants to be. She wants to study dinosaurs, but a paleontologist is someone who studies fossil remains. A paleontologist who studies dinosaur bones studies dinosaur bones. You could study fossil remains of early hominids, early human forms, and be a paleontologist as well. Now, an archaeologist studies artifacts. Hey, so I'm going back and finding these things and studying them. So wait a minute, what are artifacts? Hey, artifacts down here, our last term on this page, objects shaped by human hands. Things that people take, early humans, and make into things like uh, you know, tools, stone axes, and later computers. Okay, so we're going back in time. How do we determine how old something is? We're gonna use a little technique called radiocarbon dating. Carbon-14 decays at a given rate that we know, and we use that to go back in living things, the things and determine how old these things were. Okay, early human life begins in the in Africa, not in the early human life begins in Africa. Okay, let's back this up here. <clears throat> uh, nope, let's erase this page. So, how do we go back and figure out how old something is? How do we determine its age? We use uh, an element called carbon 14, and we use what we call radiocarbon dating. We measure the amount of carbon 14 that's left, and what's left tells us how long ago this object was created or it, how old it is. Okay. Early human life begins in Africa, in the Olduvai Gorge, uh, in the Rift Valley in Africa, in eastern and southern Africa. This is the spot where scientists believe humans began. Okay. Early hominids were nomads, people who moved from place to place in search of food. Hunters, gatherers, moving around, following the food in terms of not only the animals, but the other things that animals eat that we eat as well, eat as well, plants, this makes us nomads. Okay, let's get going, got a long ways to go. Okay, human beginnings, okay. This is a couple things we're gonna look at here. This is the old stone age, the Paleolithic time period. This is a very simple tool, but as a tool, something, an artifact shaped by human hands, it's also a piece of technology. Not like the thing you're watching me on, but still technology anyway, okay. Neolithic Revolution, look how much more shaped and contoured and much more shaping is done on this tool compared to the tool over here. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, we're gonna use these tools for things like, oh, hunting big mastodons and mammoths and our early guys here. This is our thought of early humans on the edge of survival, um, having to kill large animals to eat. Well, mostly they're still eating plant life. They're mostly vegetarians. We're getting meat. This is dangerous. Look at the tusks on this guy. I mean, for goodness sakes. Okay. So one of the big changes in early human, human beginnings is the, what's called the Neolithic Revolution. Okay. This is simply the shift from gathering to producing food. Producing food. Hey, like the farms around us, we're farming now, agriculture. 
domestication, taking animals and taming them for human purposes. We might use them to pull our plows so we can have our agriculture. We might take them so we can use them for their milk, to have dairy products, to make cheeses, yogurt if you like that. Okay, things like that. Uh, dogs for protection and for hunting. Lots of things we can do with domestication. Okay, and then technological advances. We saw the Neolithic tool or versus the older Paleolithic tool. Okay, technological advances are things that happen once we have agriculture frees people up to do other tasks. When we're producing our own food, we now can produce more food than we need with a smaller amount of people. The other folks not needed in food production are now free to do other things, other tasks, and come up with other advances in technology. Okay. One of the things that shows in the book are these early kind of cave paintings. And the big question is, and a question on your study guide is, are these things for educational purposes? Are they for spiritual purposes? I'm going to argue that, in fact, these things are for, in fact, both. Okay. They might uh, be a reaching out to the spiritual gods. They might be instructional kind of video, video, you know, early video, so to speak, showing us how what the animal looks like, how we're going to capture this and make our plan, like you know coaches do on chalkboards and stuff. But uh, in truth, scientists don't really know. This is just a best guess that it probably includes both of these things. Okay, moving on. Okay. Agriculture led to us having people with free time. Well, we're not going to give them free time because if you're sitting around doing nothing, we're not giving you any of our food. Be useful, okay? So this is the division of labor. With the division of labor, we lead to what we call civilizations. Civilizations are complex societies uh, with social structures and uh, um, uh, division of labor, as we said, obviously. Uh, but lots of things going on here cultural aspects of this we'll, we'll study it in a bit okay artisans artisans please 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 artisans not artists the things they produce may be like art but these are in fact workers skilled in a craft who make something and can do a really good job at it okay we start making things we have a civilization we start trading with other civilizations around us or even the nomads that might still be around us okay and as we trade things our ideas spread to them, and some of the things that they might do spread to us. That's called cultural diffusion, the spread of ideas between cultures. Okay, um, You might see changes in leadership based on, hey, I like their model better than the model we have. Uh, concepts of social standing oftentimes are things that spread from one culture to another. We're going to see a lot of cultures having a king being in charge, for example. Okay. And another example is the invention of writing from the Phoenicians, spread to the ancient Greeks, uh, then later to Latin, and eventually to us. Okay, let's look at some of these early civilizations. And one of the earliest is the Sumerians. And remember the folks I told you about? All the things you want to see in a movie, make a good story. These are the Sumerians. Back in 2400, 3000 BC. And one of the things these guys do is develop the earliest form of writing called cuneiform. Okay. And this is where they lived here in the Fertile Crescent, what we call Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, uh, the Tigris and the Euphrates, uh, modern day Iraq. Okay, this is cuneiform here. This is actually a later version of cuneiform, not one of the earliest forms of cuneiform. Here we can see some of the um, transitions from the outlying characters from about 3500 BC uh, to the late Babylonian time period. You can see the changes here, for example, for fish over time from sort of a picture of a fish to a symbol that represents a fish. Okay, So Sumerians, they built these temples to worship their gods. These temples are called ziggurats, and they're made of sun-dried bricks. We've had this discussion, hey, it doesn't rain much there. They're getting their water from the rivers, and the rivers are getting their source from up here in the mountains in other parts of Central Asia, or excuse me, Central Asia, the Middle East, uh, Western Asia. Okay, if we go past this, this is a ziggurat, a reconstructed one in Iraq. Uh, and if we thought, uh, artists believe that on top we would have had a temple to actually pray to our gods. Okay, let's look now at Egypt and the Egyptians. You know, walk like an Egyptian. Hey, the Nile River is the basis of, of course, our Egyptian civilization. The pharaohs are the rulers 
and world leaders leaders and as I said earlier uh, the problem we have with pharaohs is that as religious leaders they're often constrained by what they can do by what the religion dictates and what the priests actually say so priests have a lot of status keep that in mind okay hieroglyphics are pictograms like our cuneiform pictograms are a picture that represents a symbol or an object as opposed to a character like we have in our alphabet okay we talked about that idea of the fertile crescent earlier the tigris and our euphrates rivers Okay, we've also got uh, that region referred to as Mesopotamia, and that's modern day Iraq. Hey, Mr. Paul, you said all that already. Never hurts to repeat things, so you will remember. Okay, here with uh, Western Asia and in Egypt, uh, looking at uh, things in Egypt, hey, here's an early pyramid, sort of a, what we refer to as a step pyramid, as they're learning their technique. Uh, hey, trial and error, right? Look at this guy over here. This is called the Bent Pyramid. Uh, we started a little too steeply and someone said that's not going to work, it's going to fall over and so then we changed the design here and as you see that this angle we've changed to becomes the angle we use for later pyramids. Okay, let's look at uh, another kingdom in the Middle East here. This is the Israelites. They lived in what we refer to as Canaan here. Okay, uh, they had a covenant with God. God promised them, I will make you a great nation. Yes, the Israelites, we're talking about the folks, uh, Moses here, leading them away from Egypt. Okay, got to, had Egypt earlier. Now we have the Israelites escaping from Egypt. Okay, they are monotheistic. They believe in one God. Um, there's some debate about if they're the first religion to be monotheistic, them versus the Zoroastrians. Although some folks say, hey, the Zoroastrians were polytheistic and became monotheistic. The Hebrews, for the whole time, monotheistic, one God. Okay, Diaspora, this is the scattering of the Jews. As they come in, um, the Egyptians and other people who scatter them out of their kingdom, and we don't end up with a modern uh, Israel until after World War II. Okay. Another group in the area is the Assyrians uh, at various time periods. These guys had a powerful, powerful army of foot soldiers. They also had charioteers and a cavalry. These guys on horseback. Uh, another uh, group we want to talk about is the Chaldeans. Okay, they take over after the Assyrians, and the Assyrians actually, you know, had to fight and and were be fought off. Uh, by various pharaohs in Egypt. Okay, the Chaldeans take over. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar builds the Hanging Gardens in Babylon, in what is today, excuse me, down here, Babylon, uh, near what is today modern Baghdad. One of the great wonders of the world. Okay, Hittites, another uh, early civilization. This is their kingdom we see here, moving up from the Tigris and Euphrates, moving up and north from uh, the Israelites. Uh, went to what is today modern Turkey, okay? They conquered other kings in the Middle East. They borrow from the Mesopotamians. They borrow from the Egyptians. These are the guys who develop a law code, a guy named Hammurabi. Let me explain this, okay? Most people can't read and write, but he puts a big pillar in the middle of the, the big town there with all the laws inscribed upon it. No one can read it, so what's the significance? The significance is this, okay? The laws are there for everyone. You can't read it, but you could probably find a scribe or someone who could read it to you. Okay? The laws are now paramount, not the king, not Hammurabi. He's actually made himself under the law. He has to follow the law. He can't just make up any law he wants. Moving on, another group is the Persians, and this is the Persian Empire, and we're introducing them because as we get into uh, true Western civilization and start talking with the ancient Greeks, these are the folks that they're going to be fighting with a lot, okay? They're over here in what is today modern-day uh, Iran. Uh, they do not speak Arabic. They speak Farsi, uh, Persian, if you will. Okay, they are a large trading empire, and they use roads to move around. Okay, they got great leaders like Cyrus and Darius the first, who will come in conflict with, as we mentioned down here, the ancient Greeks. Okay, now this idea of great roads is going to be copied by later civilizations, primarily the Romans, uh, and then a guy uh, in Germany is going to copy that and build his autobahns. That's Hitler, sorry, uh, and then a uh, Allied general is going to copy that idea when he becomes president in the United States, and we have our interstate system. Look, I just connected the ancient Persians to Highway 30, Interstate 39. Okay, 
Phoenicians, okay, another civilization for them. These guys are famous for because they introduced the idea of an alphabet. They were a trading empire throughout the Mediterranean Sea, sailing the ships, but their alphabet is a simplistic alphabet. As opposed to learning thousands of characters, they had only 22. Wait, Mr. Foley, we have 26. Okay, they didn't use vowels. You had to imply where the vowel was, knowing what the word was supposed to be. Okay, it makes it much simpler to teach people to read and write. Uh, most people are just doing stuff for simple record keeping, but we're also, to make our trade easier, we're introducing bills and contracts. Okay, you will buy this much at this price when we deliver it. Okay, that makes trade better. Okay, to make trade even better, better rather than bargaining or bartering between what is the price, how many sheep for this cow, uh, how many cow for all that lumber, hey, the Lydians introduced the concept of coins, coined money. It's more efficient than bartering. Anything that's more efficient means it takes less time. Less time means we save money because time is money. Okay, a couple other civilizations we're gonna mention just very briefly because we wanna make sure we're not thinking, hey, everything starts there in the Middle East. The same idea of living along a river like the Egyptians did, like they did in Mesopotamia and the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, happens in the Indus River Valley, happens uh, in Chinese civilizations along various rivers. This is the Shang Dynasty here. So realize, people come upon the same idea at various times in various places at about the same time, okay? So keeping that in mind, let's move on and realize some important causes and effects. Our Neolithic Revolution, our change from the old Stone Age to the new Stone Age, leads to this idea of agriculture, okay? And agriculture then leads to a division of labor. And that division of labor is important because, like I said earlier, it allows us to create new and better things to live with, okay? Division of labor then leads to what we refer to as civilization. Okay, additional terms. Sorry, the last couple slides, a little boring, but hey, you're getting your study guide done, so I'll follow along. A confederation, okay? This is a union of several states or groups of people, okay? Maybe a good example for you guys to understand a confederation is the idea of a sports conference, the Heart of Illinois Conference that the, the Fieldcrest Knights belong to. That is an example of a confederation. We work together to put on sporting events, but they don't control what we do in our school, for example, in terms of what our rules are. Again, we mentioned an artisan. This is that person skilled in a craft. Again, don't confuse that with an artist, okay? Although they may produce things that are very beautiful and art-like. Economy, goods and services produced to serve a people's needs, okay? Whether that be um, products we need in terms of food or tools or clothing. It can also be services like building my house for me, okay? Taking care of me if I'm sick, okay? Uh, teaching you how to read and write. These are services. Barters, we talked about earlier. This is the trade of goods without money. It's a little messy trying to argue back and forth. Now, we use the word barter today even though we use money to say kind of haggling, debating the price, okay? Uh, I'll give you, I want $10 for this. How about five? Okay, uh, how about eight? How about seven? Okay, we'll meet at 750, whatever it is. That kind of bartering. Originally, bartering is this idea of trade of goods and services without money, goods for other goods. Technology. Not the technology like you guys, again, watching me on a computer here, but is this knowledge to, that allows us to make tools and do work, in fact, more work, better, faster. Last page, you happy? Only four here, getting most of our study guide done, looking at the idea of culture, the way of life of a people, and all the things that make up that way of life. Language, behavior, beliefs, okay? All these things are part of our culture and there are various aspects of those. We'll be discussing those throughout the semester, okay? A city-state. This is, I tell my students, this is the thousand point question on the test. City state, okay? You get this one right, you get the regular amount of points. You miss it, minus a thousand, okay? City state, a city and the surrounding lands, okay? City, the definitions in the name. If you can't figure that one out, thousand points off. Okay, not really, they won't let me do that, but please don't miss that one. 
Exodus, okay? This is the departure of a large group of people. Remember we saw Moses back there leading the Israelites across the Red Sea, parting the sea. That's an Exodus, okay? It's also a book in the Bible. It talks all about that, okay? And finally, a colony. And I want you to know this because this is a settlement of people who leave their homeland and live someplace else, but they're still connected to their homeland. They might be the folks who still make the rules for them, or we're going there to grow food to send back to the homeland, okay? We, as the United States, formerly a colony of England, this is important because we're going to see some of these early civilizations set up colonies, and that's how we see the spread of culture, this cultural diffusion, and this is something we want to talk about throughout the semester, throughout the whole school year, this connections, the spread of ideas, and the spread of things uh, in terms of history and knowledge and how things that happened thousands of years ago can still be relevant to you today in Monarch. Mr. Proley for Western Civ, thanks for listening.